So, so this is the keynote track, uh, keynote talk for this track. Uh, so I'd like to introduce Davi Ottenheimer. That's right. <laughs> uh, president of Flying Penguin. Um, yeah, so give it up for Davi. All right. Thanks, everybody, for coming to my talk, especially because yesterday I was sort of hiding in the the general population yesterday, I was walking around and I was standing behind some people I know quite well who are in uh, data science, known for a long time, and they said, you going to this Ottenheimer guy's talk? And they're like, ah, uh, no. Nah. And they're like, Ottenheimer's right there. And they're like, oh, yeah, probably, probably going. So appreciate you all coming. They're not here, by the way. That's why I told that joke. Uh, yeah, this is a very packed talk because actually it's, it's based on uh, books I'm writing and then also a course I teach over two days, which is about 16 hours of lecture that I'm going to compress into 30 minutes. So I've pared it down substantially. I hope there's lots of questions. But my style of talking is not like TED Talks. I'm not a fan of TED. I feel like they stretch one idea over 15 minutes to just hammer home this one point. I prefer to just glut the talk full of lots of ideas, which because of technology you can go back and watch later. Or if you have questions, you can always ask me later. But I'm trying to compress and push as much as I can through some anecdotes. And if one thing gets you out of the 50 that I tell, that's my style. So the agenda today is really, I sort of boil it down to a poem or a, uh, a style of, I would like this to be a haiku, but I couldn't quite get there, uh, a style of poetry, which is really I'm going to talk a little bit about myself and why my perspective on this I think matters in these discussions. Usually I try to take myself out of the discussion, but I think in this case my experience is unique and, and helps it. And then it's basically that we believe these machines, this future of technology is better than us, this sort of this implicit assumption that we're going someplace great, a utopian society even, and it actually turns out they repeat a lot of our mistakes, which we can tell from looking in the past. So as a historian, it really I think helps us to look at what What's happened in the past and then we can see the obvious reasons that they fail hopefully and then we can fix it if we see the reasons that we've seen these failures in the past so in my past presentations a little bit about me in 2011 I gave a talk at B-Sides I'm still kind of proud of uh, called Dr. Stuxlov where I said you know it's probably not just one actor it's probably like the United States Israel and someone else I don't know England or Germany that helped build uh, you might have seen some of this lately in the Stuxnet news but that's pretty much accurate and the way I described it was it was so well written probably that you don't have to worry about it which I think also has turned out to be accurate uh, so it was one of my favorite presentations to put together, and it goes way back. So I hope five years from now I can say the same thing about today's presentation. But I've been giving presentations since 1984, hard to believe, I know. Uh, my first one was about a secret language I discovered in Africa. I wandered off into the jungle, literally, and came back speaking something so no one had ever documented. And so you can read about it in this book called The Anthropology of Language. So it's a bit strange, I know, but, but actually it's over 30 years of presentations. Uh, some recent things I've been working on, you might have seen, I did a Jeep of Death patch fail. The day before they released the, the patch failure news, and it was all over the news, I released that the infrastructure for patching the systems is totally broken. So you could literally post a patch and anybody would grab it and put it into their Jeep, which to me seems like a terrible situation to be in when you're telling people how dangerous their cars are. Uh, so you actually make things worse. Uh, it didn't get a lot of press, but I think it was actually brought up by some lawyers who are suing Jeep. And then uh, the TNU backdoor fail, you might have seen some of that. I, I think I was the first person to point out that this was a really stupid backdoor. It wasn't really a machine learning fail. Uh, I got picked up, but I don't know how much. I wasn't able to find anyone else who figured that out before I did. Uh, the Tesla autopilot fail, I'm one of the big, uh, I feel like I'm maybe the biggest proponent of Tesla being at fault for this disaster that killed a life, and I'll talk about that today. And then recently I did this Guccifer 2 metadata reveal where I said, hey, the links in the document are Russians. tells you a lot about what was going on. And these are the books I've been working on. So in 2012, I released Securing the Virtual Environment. And then in, uh, well, last year I was supposed to have this book out, but it's taken a year uh, because the, the topic just keeps expanding, really. Uh, so it's getting bigger and bigger, ironically. All right, so the Taybot, I'm not really going to talk about much because it was a really dumb failure. Uh, I right away identified that it had a back door where you could just tell it something, which is literally or ironically dictation. So if you dictate to it what you want it to say by telling it this command, it would just repeat it. That's not learning. Uh, there's no learning iteration there. It literally is just taking the input and just repurposing it as output. So as much as we talked about it in the news as this machine learning disaster, blah, 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 it's not really because it was designed uh, to be bypassed. So uh, instead, I'd like to talk about real machine learning iterations or deep learning, where you have to learn very quickly over a long period of time in order to get to a level of expertise that's sort of amazing. So this is the boat I sail. A lot of people don't realize sailing has come this far. But you're literally flying out of the water, and you're on a 160-foot 160 pound device that requires just instantaneous knowledge. You have to be able to push the knowledge into your subconscious so that you can zip around at 20 miles an hour with no brakes in a fleet of 100 boats. 
Um, there's an article now called uh, Safety is Only an Excuse for Why You Should Limit the Use of These Vehicles. Uh, it's pretty interesting to read. From my perspective, these are incredibly dangerous, not only because you can run into things very fast, which I have done. I've crashed pretty much every vehicle I've owned. Uh, and I own a lot of vehicles, motorcycles, cars. I still have lots of vehicles, uh, I still have boats. Uh, but not only can you really crash these things and, and cause great disaster, but you can injure yourself, which isn't the case with a lot of vehicles these days. You're in a, effectively a roll cage. So when I crashed, I flew off the side of this at 15 or 20 miles an hour and landed on another boat, smacked in the side of it. Uh, so it's pretty exciting stuff. But it really is, and also when you think about flying penguin, we look at the, the lower foils, those look like penguin wings, right? Penguins literally fly. And this is what penguin wings look like when they're underwater. So that's a whole other talk, but uh, it's something a lot of people don't realize. So this is me sailing across the ocean. And one of the things I realized when I was sailing around the ocean was, you know, and people told me this too, if you see something far off in the distance, you act on it immediately. You don't wait until the last minute because you're going at a certain speed and you have no brakes and you have no ability to maneuver the way that people assume with big brakes and cars. So you change the way you think about things. You learn differently. And so honest to God, when you're out in the middle of the ocean and you see something like this, this is actually big. It would actually be smaller. If you see it, you change. Right? That's a big life lesson. And it turns out to be true because they move very fast and also don't have brakes. And if you look at this and look down, time passes very quickly. You look up, they might be right on top of you, blowing their horn. It's happened to me many times and it's a very scary event because then you're like, what do I do now? So that's sort of about me in a sense that maybe gives you some perspective on how I look at transportation. And I, like, you know, I do all sorts of transportation. I have lots of vehicles, so I'm really into it. This is a more realistic de depiction of what it's like in the ocean, though. Uh, this actually happened to me once in the Sea of Cortez, where I was sailing uh, for many days, weeks, and you see this sort of blinking red light, and it's coming towards you, and you have to react to it. But what do you do? Because it's coming towards you. Which direction do you go? And then you really only have these instruments that you can see. It's pitch black. Uh, it was a pretty scary night, pretty interesting. And still to this day, we're not sure exactly what happened. And this was just one of many days when we saw very strange things and had to react to them and had very little information. That's the reality of sailing. Uh, what did you do? Survived. <laughs> so we believe machines will do things better than us. And in fact, what we find in a lot of cases is they do things quite worse. But we still believe, <laughs> we still believe this is better. There's someone out there right now. But look at the articulation. It's so much better than the human arm, right? So this is really dangerous because it gives this impression of passing when we're actually failing. And you see this with the Google car. They came to Las Vegas. They had no weather. Uh, they had no unmarked lanes, like roundabouts. They had no crossings, nothing unpaved. They had no judgment zone where it's like unclear what to do because a bunch of kids are walking at a speed that's slower than normal. Like, it's just not hard. So they give them a pass and give them a driver's license when it's very easy, a contrived example. And you actually look at the, uh, someone did a FOIA on this. It was pretty awesome. And it actually says, it's an automated car, so let's just let it pass anyway, even though it failed two or three times, which just doesn't happen to people usually, right? And so we see this also with researchers saying, hey, we were consuming more washer fluid than gasoline just to stay on the road, uh, just to keep the sensors clear. But we'll pass that anyway as normal, right? So over and over again, we have these examples. One of my favorites is when Uber got a letter that said, you're driving on the wrong side of the road. They said, well, what really happened here is our drivers are creative. And so they're... <laughs> And this is a real problem because, you know, GPS, for example, has a certain accuracy to it. And they just revealed that Australia is literally shifting. The continents are moving. And so GPS could actually say you're in the wrong lane. There's a 20 foot drift means it's thinking you're in the right side of the road and you're on the wrong side of the road. So accuracy is very important to machines, but we're sort of giving them this sort of passing when accuracy is more important. We're giving them a lower bar. That is a very dangerous combination. And what's happening is everyone's being pushed into this world because data collection has become so cheap and machine learning has become so easy, everyone's expected to play with it. Airbnb, for example, might say to everyone in the company, you should just go and work with this stuff because you know, it's easy to use and it's available. And computers, therefore, increasingly are bearing the burden of making our decisions. We're thinking they're going to do it for us. So that's what happened in Tesla's case. There's a world-class expert. This guy was a Navy SEAL who was very experienced in all sorts of different risk situations. He decided to transfer the burden of decision to his car. And on April 17th, he said, I actually wasn't watching, and this horrible thing happened, but the, the car saved me. It was a mistake on the other driver's part, not true. And I became aware of the danger when Tessie, his car, alerted me with a takeover chime. What I saw when looking at that video immediately, remember the boat? is here's a car coming into view. You need to react now. That car's coming into your view. That car starts merging over. It's not allowed to because of the double white, but as it starts to merge over, here's an exit sign. Now there are three pieces of information to the human that says this guy's coming my direction. Very good likelihood they're gonna come towards me. Car reacted the very last second. 
So I had paced and ended up in a, a collision situation. That is a terrible decision late. People will tell me over and over again that these machine learning algorithms are faster. This is slower. Should have reacted here. It did not react till here. Now, of course, it's faster in the last second. It can react faster than the human can more safely, but that's not what we're talking about. So I actually pointed this out, and I said that far earlier we're detecting what Tesla is blind to. And this is April 17th. This is important to me because I predicted this guy's death effectively. This is the guy who died saying this. And I'm saying to him, no, this is not true. Do not trust your machine. So what happened next is he said, when I say he, I mean the CEO of the company said, you're steering to avoid a collision at this point. That car is so smart, it's doing you know, the steering for you. Really what it's doing is cruise control and lane keep assist, but actually what they're marketing it as is far more. So was Joshua Brown a victim of innovation? Well, I would say yes. Uh, the same way this kid was a victim of innovation. This robot was designed to move around a mall and try to figure out you know, who should really be uh, protected, but instead it ran over a toddler twice, right? Didn't see him, which is all it's supposed to do, is see things. So Tesla's telling you that, <laughs> right? <laughs> Tesla's telling you the auto has arrived, and it's not true. They're telling you that it relieves you of your tedious, potentially dangerous aspects of road travel. This is very misleading marketing. So Brown, in this situation, thinks, again, early victory. I can go to heaven now. Elon Musk has noticed me. This is literally what he said right before he died. Uh, tweet when he said, you know, wow, look at me. I'm in seventh heaven. So other people weren't talking like this. They were saying, oh my god, my car is very dangerous. The lanes went away because of snow. My car freaked out. Or I followed a truck, and it changed lanes, and it tried to change lanes. Uh, my car tried to change lanes into the car next to me. These are all incidents that have been reported. But they keep saying, like, there's nothing bad. It's really good. Just keep going with it. So this is what actually happened. His car basically changed lanes here and then went another uh, 900 feet because it didn't slow down. And if you really look at it as I have over hundreds of hours, I've poured over it. I looked at things like uh, Tesla saying it was against a brightly lit sky. And that's not, I think, effective as a theory. It's plausible if you look at this because, look, it looks like a bright sky over a road, right? You could actually see that as a human, that there could be some confusion there. But this is the actual situation. There's a discontin discontinuity here. What's more important is that the trucker said that he changed lanes. Why would a car change lanes at the last second? Any ideas? Right. It actually saw the car. That is the opposite of saying it didn't see it. So it actually, it actually saw the truck. What actually happened was is that it interpreted it as an overhead sign. I don't believe this, but I'll take it for face value. I think what it interpreted as is a moving bridge. I think it saw <laughs> these two side panels moving, and it thought the road is moving. Why is that important? Because the GPS is telling you right now you're on a road that doesn't curve. The GPS sensor should tell you I'm on a straight road. It also should tell you there's a left turn lane. Those are two important factors that should, be not, dis should not be discounted because if you know you're in a left turn uh, area, high risk of someone crossing the lane of a straight road, right? So humans can do this much better than cars. Uh, this is what the truck saw, 1,000 feet away, a car coming towards him. So this is where you need to make that decision, just like the boat example I gave you. He was going 75 speeding, but he effectively had about 10 seconds. And that's a long time to not do anything. So, when Tesla finally did something at the last second, it was too late. All right, so what is that? I call that the learning expectations gap, and it kills. You think that things are getting better because Tesla tells you we're improving things all the time. You really don't know what's happening in your car. They may be rolling things back, making it worse. They may be moving things forward, making it better. You have no idea, even as a world-class Navy SEAL expert in demolitions and electronics. This guy was an amazing person, understood risk better than anybody, and couldn't figure it out. And so what you actually get over here is actual features versus what you expect this thing to be doing, which I don't think anyone in the world can figure out that safety margin. I really don't think it's safe, and I think Tesla has some accountability here. So here's some examples of what it looks like. Segnet, I don't know why they called it that, it's like Skynet, is a, a system that they call remarkably good because it can take input and figure out how to segment it, right? This is for cars. So it does learning, they call it remarkably good. The people who make it call it remarkably good. Uh, so in England, for example, here's a road, and this is what it looks like, road, tree, it's pretty good, right? It does some fair. So I ran it through Botswana. This is a building. <laughs> okay, so what are they doing? They're reinforcing things they know as good. They're not looking at exceptions and trying to say, well, it's good in very certain circumstances, but otherwise we suck. Your car would be in absolute paralysis looking at a large building here. All right, so it actually seems like machines are repeating the same mistakes that we're making, uh, and they're just doing it a little faster. So here's a guy getting angry, and the machine says, oh, yeah, you want to get angry? I'll show you angry. <laughs> Take that. 
So what's happening is that we have this market that's basically driving the price down so fast and making it so accessible that everybody's rushing in to grab this stuff and do great things, create our utopian society. And we're making it as brain dead as possible, right? This is Google talking about brain dead. This guy's an expert, by the way, because he works at Google and he writes speeches for the chairman on an iPad and a smartphone. So if you really look at history, I'm a historian by training, that's what my degree is from London School of Economics. Uh, history tells us that we'll turn, hell, we'll turn Earth into hell with automation. That's what the machine gun did. If you think about gunpowder as a positive thing, you can easily use it for negative things. If you think about data as a positive thing, you can easily turn it into negative things. So what if we use data like gunpowder for machine guns to create hell on Earth? What's to stop that? It's not going to be machines, I can tell you that. It's going to be humans. So how do we stop terrible things? Well, here's a great example of what's happening. 2008, data-driven campaigns. Data-driven journalism. And today, what do we have? Rage. <laughs> Incoherent rage and fact-free delirium. It's actually possible that we go the wrong way. And in this market, we're basically saying everyone gets a sword. This is literally a post about how every data scientist in every possible field is going to get a sword to go play with. Uh, so we're looking at them as weapons. So anyone can get out and grab their weapon and pull the trigger. And here's an example of how to do facial analysis. Uh, it's a step-by-step. -step. It tells you how to get the data and do the, the work. And they end with, how does this work? It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter to us. They literally say we have no idea. It doesn't matter. The fact is we just get it right. And so what are you measuring? Getting it right today or getting it right a thousand iterations from now when it really matters? Life is on the line. So here's some examples of where it might matter. I mean, serial war criminals, somebody can smuggle out a lot of images. We can do machine learning on it and we can figure out who's actually being tortured and by whom. There's a real useful world case examples of important stuff. I worked on a, a project like this for uh, torture, so I can advocate for this quite effectively. Here's what Facebook would look like if you think of it slightly differently. Facebook has non-lethal analysis of trajectory. They're targeting by, project, by prediction, but I always try to tell people that means I can drop a hellfire on you if I can predict where you're going to be effectively. And there's a deep, deep area of research here that people should look into. Uh, for example, why somebody keeps getting hellfired when they're innocent on the flip side versus hellfired when they're actually guilty. So, and this is actually a, a Kaggle competition. If you help with this, you may be helping with that, is kind of my point. Uber says they're not doing fraud when they do data analysis, but we have many instances where it does look like they're using it for fraud. Like they're giving you higher surge pricing when your battery is lower. Um, I think it's a pretty good indication. And in fact, when they actually raise their surge, they say the algorithm did it, don't blame us, no one's in charge, which is complete BS. Um, I see this a lot of times in San Francisco. I see the algorithms of the shipping company saying block the lanes, cause safety hazards because it's profitable for them. But they're saying, hey, we're not doing any fatality data analysis. We're just doing you know, common sense data analysis. Amazon did this where they said that they were delivering to places that made the most sense, but it just ended up being very racist. The white zone is black, the blue zone is white. The traditional lines of racism reinforced by Amazon shipping using data analysis. Uh, Pokemon don't go zones, same thing. They crowdsource the data, not really machine learning, but easily could be, where they're not going to black neighborhoods because the data analysis they're using didn't have those as part of their data set. So we end up with this police algorithms for policing the police. It becomes a sort of iterative auditing the auditor problem. Um, we saw this also with machine bias in criminal data, probably one of the best examples, where they say they're going to predict who's going to be a recidivist, who's going to continue doing crime, and it just happened to think all the blacks would and not the whites. So there's so many failures to go through. Uh, here's an example where I was convinced it was a failure, but actually I might be wrong and it might be right. I tried to do all the wrestlers, and it pointed out that the people who are on the bottom are very happy. <laughs> Maybe they are having a good time. I don't know. Uh, but actually, ultimately, when I was doing a lot of facial analysis, I found it very easy to trick the systems. Extremely easy, because they use these patterns for features, and I just had to put some other shadows and things in place, and they just go crazy. They can't find me. Right? This is an extreme example, but this is one of the first examples I found that they couldn't find me. So, Your outrageous speaker request, sir. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> well, that's hot. <laughs> uh, that's right on time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, 10 minutes, we have a lot of content, so let's just zip on. All right, so anyone want to guess what unprofessional hair looks like? This is real. I did this search. Uh, this came up from some black women that pointed it out to me, and I, I did it. So professional hair. Do you see a problem already? Do you see diversity in this sample set? Right away, somebody who learned by traveling a lot or knows a lot about the world would look at this and go, whoa. All right, we have a huge problem. This is Google. Girls, women, even men, they go and look at professional hair. They get that result. What, what do they get if they look at unprofessional hair? Black women. No kidding. This is a disaster. This is supposed to be a smart learning system. 
I mean, this is the actual example that everyone knows probably, right? Where it said it, the failover from the learning system was to animals. And when they did failover for whites, it failed to dogs apparently. And they were like, oh, that looks terrible. So they fixed for the whites. And then they didn't think about what happens if the blacks fail over to animals. Well, they failed over to gorillas. And it was because of shading errors. Like as soon as there's dark shading or some sort of weird, uh, the features were lost. Once the features were lost, it just failed over to this other thing. And it obviously upset some people. And then here's the discussion between them about how to fix it. Like, oh yeah, really interesting problems and in image recognition here. No, you're, you're offending people. <laughs> like you're causing great harm. All right, so some obvious reasons for this failing. Uh, even in the 80s, people were saying AI can't solve all our problems. We need to be realistic about it. They can solve for very narrow data sets. Our learning doesn't like iterate fast enough. We need to be realistic about it. Don't expect an easy help button right on your computer that just figures out what you meant when you're typing gibberish and just turns it into Shakespeare. All right, so, and Trump does this a lot, actually. He says, no, that's not what I meant. I meant all these other things when I said that. This sort of like, just figure it out, just go Google it. Google will figure it out for you. It's just nonsense. People need to think harder. Uh, Google has an ML ethics guide where they talk about all the things they should avoid, and it sounds good, but as a trained ethicist, as a trained expert in history and philosophy, I looked at this and said, what they're doing is saying, avoid cost to us, avoid cost to us, avoid cost to us. The do no evil at Google really is make sure that we avoid costs that could cause us to like do something else. Avoid negative, as opposed to thinking more generally as ethics should be, which is categorical imperatives, for example, like privacy, fairness, security. These are important things we should achieve. So their goals are like down here when we should be putting goals up here. Like have you achieved fairness or have you achieved avoiding an impact to you? And so Tesla does this effectively by saying, well, we can avoid people blaming us by just saying that, you know, uh, 130 million miles have been traveled and we haven't seen any problems. Well, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about we found a problem and what's going to happen in the future. Have we achieved something that's worth you know, noting as a success or have we achieved something that's still a failure? Uh, they're not qualifying it as autopilot oversight, for example. So we don't know how many Browns there are out there. Maybe he was the only guy that really pushed the edge. He was an expert in risk. So he felt safe, pushing, pushing all the way to where there's no margin of safety. I wouldn't have felt safe from my sailing experience. He didn't sail. So maybe that's why there's a big difference between us. But I think his life was a tragedy that did not have to happen. In fact, they tried to warn him on April 17th. All right, so there's data and then there's data. I mean, if we look at what we're trying to actually figure out, every aviation failure I've found, 100% of them have been investigated. When we look at cars, we've done like 0.0007% of accidents. So I don't want Tesla telling me that we understand the problem and that you know, there haven't been any accidents. This is not a safety zone. We're at 1960 levels of car failure, if you look at the, the, the map. And this is what it looked like after the investigation. They took nine days to report it. They left all this debris in the front yard. That doesn't happen in airplane crashes. You don't leave all the debris and just take your time to tell people that there was a major accident that could affect the future of everyone's lives. Google does the same thing. They say, hey, we don't know what the laws were. It's not a big deal. We haven't any accidents. And I did the research on Google's uh, errors, and I found there are 40 states that have two slow laws. But Google's saying, I bet humans don't get pulled over for two slow laws. Well, actually, they get pulled over a lot all the time. And there are more laws being passed all the time. So it's just this basic ignorance of what our goals are. So for example, we have levels at the NHTSA that we should be talking about, not Tesla's marketing collision avoidance, actual levels that cars should be measured to. And even if you don't accept the government regulating it, this is a commercial version that has six levels that tells you what level you should be at. Tesla's down here, but they're talking about this, right? There's a big difference, false expectations. So in reality, cars are struggling down there at level one. I mean, they're struggling to deal with freeways. That's what Brown died on, essentially. There was a left turn across the freeway. That was the fault. But don't put them on boulevards and residential places when they can't even figure out how to save lives down at the, the low levels. And we see false victory even here. Google said the other day in a presentation, wow, driverless two, human zero, when a bicycle ran in front of it and it stopped. Well, actually, that's false. The bicycle, as a human, anticipated the car coming towards it and rode around it. And Google takes the victory as their own because they hit the brakes. That's not fair. Again, as a sailor, you see this all the time. Nobody has brakes. Everybody's doing this all the time. And you don't say, wow, I narrowly have missed that person when the world champion sails in front of somebody. You don't take the victory. You look at them and say, that guy just sailed in front of me at full speed and didn't hit me. That's amazing, right? Which has happened to me. I thought I was going to win and then all these people sail in front of me and they all get the bell and I go, I just lost. I totally lost that race. In the last five seconds, 20 people just went right in front of me. All right, so how do we fix this? Don't do things like this, where you say, in the future, everyone's going to be saved. What did you do in the past? Well, no one died that way. Oh, no, of course, everyone died that way. Oh, well, then immediately we should start you know, 
accepting solutions that, will allow, that won't allow humans to die. Because really we get into this ethical dilemma where everything causes death. I mean, if you accept this or if you think this way, ultimately you should stop driving now because cars kill. So start taking the bus. Done. Don't try to improve cars, just get out of the car boat business. But that's not what people will accept. They're like, no, no, I still want a car. Okay then, let's talk about the trade-offs. Right? Instead, think about what we've been talking about for hundreds of years. Uh, this is John Locke, for example, who said in 1693, be reflective in your process of thinking. A big advance from the 1637 where I think I don't just take answers from Google as law. And he was talking about God, but today people say, I read it on Google, so it must be true. But the reflective process really means uh, accepting feedback, admitting possible inadequacies, challenging assumptions, that, expressing your fears, saying, I think Tesla's going to kill me. Uh, and basically being the grain of sand to create those oysters in machine learning. So taking control. Don't allow stuff like this, where people fall asleep in the Tesla and go, wow, that is a harbinger of things to come. We can all sleep in our cars. Amazing. No, take responsibility. This person has an unauthorized transfer of responsibility and is avoiding really the augmentation in order to get to authorimitation, which is my word for uh, this sort of automation that has been authorized. It's basically being like a, a no-brainer. Not a good place to be. We don't want to be no-brainers. Instead, we should hold, I create another word, I can't resist. So the owner of an algorithm, the algoner, uh, you should hold them accountable. And really, we should try to improve the world so we set our measures high enough that we're actually trying to make machine learning successful and, and not accept these disasters, even the small disasters, as exceptions or outliers. We should really think of them as harbingers of what could happen. Uh, we should be trying to create our, our practices. Uh, we should practice and, and promote to preserve security. So really what I'm looking at is a trusted reflective learning model. And if I was going to give an example of what that would look like, uh, there's a US doctor who just did some amazing work. And one of the things that came out to me when I was reading his success in how to get rid of problems was he educated humans as owners. And then he assigned them sensors. Which if you think about it, if you're an owner of a Tesla, you're being given all these sensors. What if you push that ownership down to those individuals? And Brown, I get that he loved his car, but what if he had been filing all the flaws and thinking about it in those terms instead of trying to convince people that he could push success higher and higher when he was way ahead? He was in a beta mode that he didn't even understand the risks of. Uh, so this has been very successful for this doctor. And the thing he talks about specifically is he got out of the, the I'm from America role, which a lot of people do when they move into uh, countries where they're trying to solve health issues. Like you have malaria? Well, I'm from America. I'm here to save you. Uh, it doesn't work. And so and there's a lot of philosophical and anthropological reasons for that. But bottom line is you don't want to tell people what to do and tell them they're ignorant and they should just wait for this utopian society to come. What you really want to do is give them responsibility. Make them some part owner. And the same is true in security. When you talk about patching, when you talk about uh, all these risks and social engineering, it's about pushing responsibility to people where they become intelligent actors uh, and they have control of their own destiny. And adding sensors to this doesn't change anything. If anything, it gives them more to work with. So you give them a machine gun, you have automation, it doesn't change the responsibility of how to use that machine gun. Right? Sure, they can kill more people, but they're still responsible for who they kill. And so that's why I th want to think about it, right? And we don't really hold the manufacturer of the machine guns accountable. So this is why these worlds collide, I feel like. We're really talking about ethics, cognition. We're talking about responsibility. It's not math. It, math is involved, but a lot of people say, just wait for engineering to solve the world's problems. It's just another engineering problem. We're getting out of engineering at this point, and we're getting into these deep issues of philosophy and cognition. And so that's basically uh, two days' worth of lessons in 30 minutes, and uh, hopefully that satisfies the keynote requirement. So thank you very much. Yeah. Question? Yeah. Want to use the microphone? Yeah. Was that working? No, there we go. So you're actually talking about, like, don't trust full automation, but what level of machine assistance is perfectly acceptable in your head? I would actually say trust full automation, but you don't trust it until you have some proof that full automation is safe. Um, I'll give you a good sailing example. We have autopilots all the time, and we set them and we go to bed, and it takes over the entire boat, everything. Um, but here's the problem that happened to some friends of mine. I happened to be giving a presentation, so I missed this particular trip, luckily. They set the autopilot, went to bed for a spit of land sticking out, and they ran the boat right into the land. So it did not detect the land. Same thing that happened to Brown. Um, so you set it where you think all the conditions are satisfied. And if you can't account for all the possible conditions, as a human, you see much bigger space, 
then it shouldn't be handed over. You don't authorize it when you don't think it can handle the situation coming up, which is not, I'm not making this up. Like Stanley Kubrick said this in 2001. He said, you give complete control to Hal, at some point Hal will try to kill you and you need to have this other plan. Okay. <laughs> which for him was disabling right. Hal, right. but yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Questions? Yeah. I think you're done with your speech now, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for getting the talk. Um, you, you'd mentioned that uh, Google's search biases. Um, did you factor in the idea of the, the, the search bubble where Google can basically reflect your own biases back to you? Oh, yeah, for sure. So there, there is a lot of that, that you're affecting your own situation. In fact, there are other examples of women being given lower paying job ads and they say, well, that's a reflection of the, you being a woman. Right? So it's not just that your biases are reflected back to you, but it's not being able to account for historical biases as error and trying to change that. And so thinking of, well, I'm reflecting back what I think you would like as opposed to I'm reflecting back what honestly would be what we should achieve or strive towards. Uh, so, so, I mean, do, do you think that like Google should basically be sort of setting more or less like the where society should go? At that point? Yeah, that's right. But I don't think it should be Google should be setting where we should be going. It goes back to humans should be thinking about their responsibility individually. So I'm not saying Google's responsible. I guess you could say the corporation is a person. You get into that whole thing. Sure. But as an entity, we're all responsible. So Google should look at that and take the feedback and go, that doesn't look like a fair result. Maybe it's a function of us reading something from them and we're misinterpreting it. So Yeah, I mean, I looked up professional hair like while you were doing it, and I got basically 50-50. Um, it, they've in changed my, it. In my results, but they they, they, they changed it. it since the result. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. But but it's because see this is the this is the key. They've changed it because of the the pushback, and yeah. so they respond when they feel like there's regulation, but they're anti-regulation. So that's what you have to figure out. Mm. How do you take feedback from somebody as authoritative if you reject it from a regulator because you're a libertarian and you don't believe in regulation? So what is the level of this is where unions come into play? The United States became a union of states. Not many people realize this, but it was a union exercise. The colonies became a union to fight the king. So the history of America is unionizing. And so what number of people have to get together and say to Uber or Google or UPS, this isn't fair before they actually accept it as feedback? Because that's a power distribution that's not fair. You could end up very easily with Google saying, screw you, or Uber saying, it's good for us, good for business, sucks for you. That's, that's why it's difficult. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Sorry, we've got to get set up for the next talk. Okay. Thank you.